Okay, so I found the video. I found finally where Nobel physicist Gerard de Hooft and Nobel physicist Roger Penrose are having their big debate about what happens at the end of the universe. And this is Gerard de Hooft's um, eternal black hole. And this is, this is actually time frequency non-commutativity. He doesn't use that word, but this is the time translation. And Penrose says, um, okay, but is that full of matter or is it empty or what? So he's talking about this is the past. And Gerard de Hoof says, yeah, it's full of matter. And Penrose's whole point is that if it's full of matter, there has to be a the Einstein equivalence principle, which causes a um, logical paradox, a uh, uncertainty between um, uh, quantum entanglement and um, the two particles of matter. And therefore, the, the matter wins out and then you get a relativistic singularity as the Hawking point and that destroys all information but you'll still get gravitational waves that come through to the new universe and through the black hole singularity and Dehoof says that's a very good question excellent question because um What's called vacuum here is completely filled with space. Here to the to the observer sees that other high precision of the universe. However, it's got energy inverted, frequency and time inverted. And so so that this is empty space here, but from here on when you look when it looks through this point, you'll see a completely full universe again. And so um, Gerard de Hooft, he's saying you're not going to see this until the black hole singularity is vanishing due, the Hawk, due to the Hawking radiation, which is based on this quantum entanglement process of the, um, the particle being entangled in, through the black hole singularity. And so... Um, the uh, Gerard de Hoof says this only takes place at the microsecond time frame of the, the final microsecond time frame of the black hole. Now what's fascinating about that is the microsecond wavelength is the ultrasound, ultrasound frequency, which makes sense because that gets you to the ultrasound catastrophe in that was at the very origin of uh, quantum physics originally with the Planck background radiation. Whereas um, Penrose is saying the Planck background radiation um, resolves back to gravitational waves and that, you know, he goes into, it goes right back to where they diverged ret retrocausally in the, as this is what Penrose, I'm quoting Penrose here. Okay, so he's talking about if you have an entangled particle, you know, it goes back to the, because it has the two through the black hole. So you'll get a gravitational wave that then, that then is seen in the background microwave radiation based on the temperature difference as as a red shifted or blue shifted, um, it would actually be um, that's where it gets confusing because it's the opposite shift because we're looking at it from the time reversal. And um, and uh, And so he's saying that that would be the entropy. He's saying that the entropy, it doesn't matter 
um, whether it's quantum or gravi gravity because the information gets lost through this um, black hole singularity at the end of the universe, yet um, the origin of the universe has very low entropy and therefore it's uh, asymmetric time. It's coherent and asymmetric time. Now, the question is, are these, are these really in incompatible? I mean, are they, are they really different? Penrose, he says that um, Gerard de Hooft is wrong. But the thing is, is that I don't know if they are incompatible. I, I, I emailed Penrose because he's saying that the, the phase for the relativity, when you do the equivalence principle with the entanglement, you get a time cubed phase. And so that would be non-commutative. And that's exactly what um, Gerard de Hooft is arguing. He's ar arguing that this non-commutative um, phase is what you, what causes this inversion. And so this would be the red shifted, and then it, it looks blue shifted to us, but it's actually red shifted from the past universe. That's what Penrose's point is. So where we see the, the blue shifted increase in uh, temperature, it's due to it being red shifted in the previous universe. So I don't, I really don't see. Now Penrose, he admits that he doesn't understand non-commutative quantum algebra because his whole um, focus has been relativity for, you know, so, and then whereas Gerard de Hoof says he's using the S2 geometry, now that's a quantum, that's the non-commutative quantum algebra. So I think, I think they're both correct. I just think that they're, they're not. Okay, so, the, okay, so this gets me into this idea that the, what is the particle? Because it, because Penrose says that all mass originates as frequency, which would be the Hawking radiation would be just a photon as frequency, as radiation. But it's, but it then, as the microwave background radiation, it's, it originated from gravitational waves. So the gravitational waves have a high, they have a low entropy, whereas the the matter is all just energy with high entropy at the beginning of the of the universe. And so the the idea here is that the the matter originates from the photons because all matter is actually from light originally and how how this how this is explained is due to the non-local one-half spin. Uh, so the electron actually has, it's secretly made out of light. Um, and, and light therefore has a secret one-half spin because of the relativistic mass of the light. And this is, and Gerard de Hooft, he understands this. And I'm not sure I'm not sure that Penrose has totally grasped this concept of light having the relativistic mass because that that's actually a super momentum from quantum quantum uh, frequency. The that relativistic mass is actually a super momentum reverse time. Um, like it's it's a so it's not no okay so then this. This guy is ar arguing that um, this is. I found I found several. Okay, John G. Williamson. He argues that this, the electron is actually a one half spin photon. You know, two of them, 
in uh, 720 degrees because you can't measure the electron until it's 720 degrees. So I emailed John G. Williamson because he's not the only one. There's 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 this other guy, Rod, Roger Gautier. He's made the same argument. And John G. Williamson, he was making it with Martin Vandermark, who co-wrote that paper with Gerard de Hooft. So it all goes back to Gerard de Hooft again. So then I just found this other paper by these this these Greek Greek physicists. Now this is this appears to be the same type of animation that uh, Ger- that John G. Williamson has in his um, interview. So I sent these the Greek physicists. I sent them the video of John G. Williamson, and then I sent John G. Williamson the video of the Greek physicists. I'm like, is this the same thing? So they're saying this is the the actual. Uh, toroid, the the non-commutative donut. You don't see it at first. But what's really happening is that that donut is rotating 360 degrees. And then when you flip it, it's non-commutative because the inside of the donut is not the same. It's like a sphere. A sphere would be symmetrical. That's why you use a donut because you're getting that flipping right in the center there. So that's what this is. But then since it's 720 degrees, the particle itself has to flip twice as fast as the rotation, as the 360 degree rotation around the toroid. So you get this 720 degree um, speed, you know, you get a double rotation of the particle, you know, as the electron within this photon. And so it looks like this in the end. And then you have to imagine this is rotating around, you know, so that's the true, the S2 S2 surface is that flipping that's non-commutative of time and frequency as the light. And that's what creates matter. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Oh, and he gets into the graphing. So he says that graphing shows that this is what happens. That the electron behaves like a photon in the graphing. And that gets back to Sarfati, Sarfati's plan for uh, anti-gravity uh, spacecraft. And, okay, thanks.